Secretary of State John Kerry was in Ethiopia last week ostensibly to discuss security issues. But it quickly became clear that the security of Ethiopian citizens who are arbitrarily arrested and subjected to extrajudicial killings were not on Kerry's priority list. As Secretary Kerry visited the East African nation last week, his hosts greeted him with news of fresh arrests and detentions of opposition party leaders and members, journalists and bloggers, and massacres of university students. For this segment of Moving the Center, my guest is sociologist and activist Fikra Jesus Amahasian, a specialist on human rights and economic development in East Africa. Welcome to Moving the Center, Fikra Jesus. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You recently published an article on Pambazuka News and other media outlets that discusses this recent mm -hmm. spate of harsh crackdowns on civil liberties and human rights in Ethiopia. Give us some historical and political context for what's actually going on. Well, um, the arrests, um, they, they, they were conducted on the eve of Secretary uh, John Kerry's visit um, in early May, actually. Um, what we saw was a, a group of um, nine bloggers and um, uh, journalists, freelance journalists, that were arrested without warning, um, without um, without a prior warning, and uh, they were arrested without access to lawyers, without access to family, uh, and they've been detained um, since. the 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 arrests were made um, along the lines of um, Ethiopia's anti-terrorism law that was uh, proclaimed in 2009 under the uh, previous prime minister Meles Zenawi. And so these these laws were, um, you know, passed on a platform of, uh, you know, anti-terror being a response to um, you know, counteract terrorism, to promote internal stability and security. Whereas, uh, in fact, they are seen by different uh, observers and analysts as a way to uh, crack down on different types of dissent or um, discontent voiced by the opposition, by uh, the free press and the like. So so what were some of the uh, specific claims, perhaps, or political leanings more broadly of these bloggers that would have this specific group be targeted? Well, um, this uh, it's it's not only uh, this specific group. All types of um, uh, journal the free press in Ethiopia is harshly restricted. It has one of the uh, worst um, free press uh, records in uh, the entire world. Uh, people like the Committee for uh, to Protect Journalists, um, uh, Reporters Without Borders, uh, consistently rank Ethiopia as one of the uh, bottom um, uh, countries when it comes to these types of things. So these, um, this particular group has, um, you know, voiced different types of uh, displeasure uh, with the uh, current regime in power in Addis Ababa. And um, uh, they were, uh, they had um, knocked down a little bit of their um, uh, discontent in prior weeks, but this arrest came right uh, on the eve of John Kerry's visit, uh, plausibly maybe to um, you know counteract any potential um, uh, you know things that would be released during his visit. Mm -hmm. I understand that there was some pushback against university students as well. Is that linked to the oppositions that that were voiced by the journalists, or how do these connect? Um, well, it, they're not directly um, connected. The, the, the students um, who are uh, protesting, um, this is uh, in the Romia region, um, and this is uh, particularly in response to uh, the central government's um, plans to um, claim land around the university within this region. And so uh, the students were, um, the, this protest actually occurred during Secretary Kerry's visit. And um, the the protests were largely led by students, youths, and um, they they wanted to uh, you know essentially let the government know that uh, they did not want the government to come in and uh, you know takes a, a lot of this land around their uh, general area. And the government, as has um, been uh, conducted in the past, uh, conducted a violent um, uh, violent crackdown. When I wrote the article, this was uh, in early May, late April, early May. Um, there, there had been reports of up to 50 people um, killed. Um, since then, the protests have continued, and um, there are, uh, you know, different unverified reports of up to 70, 80 uh, students um, killed. So, help us understand a little bit about the popular opinion within Ethiopia of uh, current Prime Minister Haile de Salen. I understand that he was put into place through a transfer of power after the death of the previous Prime Minister, Menes Amnawi. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, help us understand a little bit, did he have a legitimacy problem coming in? What are the public attitudes about the Prime well, Minister? Why? Well, um, the 
the current um, ruling party, the EPRDF, the Ethiopian People's uh, Revolutionary Democratic Front, um, it uh, it's seen largely as um, a continuance of the TPLF, which was um, a rebel movement that uh, played a role in um, helping um, the current um, Ethiopian uh, government come into power in the mid to early uh, 1990s. Um, the 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 government in power doesn't have too much legitimacy amongst uh, a lot of the the people. Um, so if we go back to say the elections in 2005, um, these were uh, you know. Um, largely seen as rigged or uh, having uh, very many irregularities by uh, international analysts and observers. Um, uh, future elections, local and regional elections afterwards, um, have often been boycotted by different um, opposition uh, groups, which uh, suggest that they will not have um, a, a fair, um, you know, a, a fair uh, a fair access to being uh, democratically elected, and um, it, it will be interesting to see what the uh, 2015 um, next year's um, elections will bring, because um, largely Ethiopia is seen as being led by a minority uh, regime, and uh, that does not always have the the best interests of uh, its citizens at heart. So on the heels of what you just said, and, and, and I want to say for the listeners that I'm speaking with Fikri Jesus Amahasian, who is speaking to us from his university office. So we have a little traffic there in the background. At any rate, you just touched on the upcoming elections in 2015. Is there truly a viable multi-party democracy or some dynamics thereof in Ethiopia? Um, it's, a, it's a democracy in name only. Um, uh, Secretary Kerry's visit was actually um, done upon a platform of promoting rights, promoting uh, democracy. But um, uh, largely, Ethiopia, if you if you consider uh, the various um, political science or international relations uh, indicators, is often seen as one of the most autocratic um, authoritarian governments in the world. Um, it, it, it keeps its power by cracking down, stifling any opposition, any uh, dissent. And uh, when it does hold uh, elections, um, they're largely um, show elections. It, it reminds me a lot of um, Egypt up uh, up north, where um, you know you would have elections where um, uh, the the ruling party would be elected on a platform of say 90, 95 percent, whereas um, it's only uh, fooling themselves. Everybody knows that uh, they're not being conducted in a in a fair way. And I think the the other thing, if we would like to consider legitimacy, we can say we can think of the um, the the rap- of protests that have uh, consistently um, occurred over the last year. So if we begin in 2005, um, protests that uh, arose in response to the um, uh, rigged elections, according to international analysts. Um, Since then, we've had the Blue Party, a very um, viable, large um, opposition movement that consistently has protested, um, being cracked down upon with the Muslims protest uh, due to the uh, government's uh, continued uh, incursions and interventions into um, various uh, religious religious life and of course you have uh, in the east um, in the um, one of the regional states in the east you have an ongoing uh, insurgency by the Oromo National Liberation Front which um, uh, is uh, seeking a greater autonomy and uh, um, seeking more equitable uh, distribution of resources more rights this type of thing so it sounds like from your account there is ample organized political resistance within Ethiopia and with the elections approaching I suppose my question is are there particular opposition parties that seem particularly viable in terms of claiming power in the upcoming elections and then therefore does this account for the scaling up of the political crackdowns in fact I understand there are hundreds of political prisoners in custody in Ethiopian prisons at this time I I would imagine and that that may be related to some of these broader political trends that you're speaking about. And yeah, just um, just a, a point to build upon what you were talking about in terms of the organized uh, opposition. We also see a large organized opposition within the diaspora, um, and so they um, mm-hmm. they act obviously as a as a way to uh, publicize a lot of uh, these accounts that uh, we hear coming out of Ethiopia because the the. Um, uh, the the journalistic environment there is so stifled. So a lot of what we hear comes out of um, opposition uh, groups based in the diaspora. But um, I, to to be honest, there um, I, I I don't really see any uh, changing of the guard, so to speak. Uh, in 2015, the the regime has um, uh, 
it has essentially uh, you know held on to power for so long, and um, it uh, it will continue to do so. So we may see uh, another face. We may see the the current foreign minister, uh, Dr. Tedros. Um, maybe assume power in 2015. A lot of people are suggesting he uh, he may be next in, in line. So um, uh, I think we will see the the EPRDF continue to uh, remain in power. We will see continued um, human rights violations, crackdowns, and um, uh, more of the same. And this is not nothing new. If you're familiar with the Ethiopian history, uh, if you go back decades um, uh, throughout the 1900s, whatever. Um, government or leadership has been in power has uh, harshly cracked down upon large segments of its own population. So if you think of Haile Selassie, the emperor, uh, he uh, cracked down on uh, various um, different groups within um, uh, his regions. Uh, after that, you had the, the Colonel Mengistu, a, a communist Marxist leader who, was, uh, who had a harsh, brutal reign. And um, since the early 1990s, you have the current um, TPLF uh, minority government. You mentioned in your article, Fikra Jesus Amahajan, the article titled Ethiopia, Human Rights, Repression, Carrots and Sticks. You mentioned that Ethiopia has been highly dependent on external economic assistance for quite some time. I want to ask you, what role does uh, external assistance from the U.S. have to play, if any, in the stability of the autocratic regimes in Ethiopia? Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, Ethiopia's uh, dependency, um, reliance on uh, for all types of foreign support, diplomatic support, say at the UN, um, uh, economic, humanitarian type of assistance, uh, military assistance is not nothing new. This is, um, you know, a pattern that has uh, been uh, set for decades now, particularly since the end of the Second World War. Uh, Ethiopia has long had a close relationship with the United, uh, various United States administrations. Uh, even during its time as a, a communist Marxist government, it received a uh, high amounts of um, uh, humanitarian aid at the same time that it was receiving military aid from, say, the USSR. Uh, in terms of the, the U.S.'s uh, support, essentially, um, U.S. support has long been used to, um, you know, maintain the current government uh, uh, in power, and um, it's often that that type of uh, foreign aid is used uh, as a way to um, uh, stifle the um, stifle the. Uh, Population. So, if we think of food aid, food aid has often been used as a uh, as a political uh, tool. So, uh, when um, foreign governments give um, you know vast amounts of food aid to the uh, government, uh, the government uses it as a tool to uh, garner support or uh, stifle any types of opposition. Just a moment ago, you spoke about the extensiveness of the Ethiopian diaspora and its potential influence in shaping public opinion, in getting the word out about human rights violations in Ethiopia. You yourself are a human rights advocate. What do you suggest can be done uh, in a diasporic context to continue to keep this conversation going about what's happening in Ethiopia and potentially to influence U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Ethiopian state? Well, um, the the first role of the diaspora um, uh, is particularly uh, illustrated uh, in the uh, recent crises from within Ethiopia. So, a lot of what we've heard uh, in regards to the arrest of these bloggers, in regards to the Oromo protests, have been um, uh, you know shared on social media by people within the country, and then um, they've been uh, publicized, advertised by very many. Um, uh, significant uh, groups with uh, around the world, the diaspora. Um, uh, in, in, in relation to what could be done by various uh, diaspora groups, we, we've seen a spate of um, protests in front of uh, foreign embassies, in front of uh, foreign uh, diplomatic buildings. Just in Atlanta, just yesterday, we saw um, the Oromo protests in front of the CNN building for its uh, lack of coverage or lack of um, attention to this these serious issues. Um, we've seen it in, in Minnesota. We've had hunger strikes by um, diaspora members trying to bring light to these issues. We've seen it um, uh, essentially all over the world and very um, uh, in, in cities where there are significant diaspora communities. So I, I think the one role that the diaspora can uh, play is particularly awareness, creating awareness. Um, just because um, very many foreign communities aren't aware of the um, extent of um, human rights violations occurring within Ethiopia. The diaspora can play a role in advertising, um, publicizing, sorry, um, what's going on. The second thing is um, by becoming organized and by becoming, um, uh, you know, coming together as groups, um, the potential is there to uh, particularly put pressure on foreign governments to uh, stop funding these, um, you know, terroristic uh, uh, tyrants. Uh, according to William Easterly, you know, um, the West needs to stop 
funding this um, tyrannical regime. Well, thank you so much for your opinion and for helping to raise awareness about these issues. Fikr Jesus Amahasian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Fikr Jesus Amahasian is a sociologist and an activist based right here in Atlanta.